Hey Siri, when is my wedding anniversary? What? You forgot? Again? <sighs> hey Siri, please order some large roses and a apology card. <sighs> Finding directions to the doghouse. <laughs> yes, we've been there, haven't we? Some of us. Um, no, seriously, we have. <laughs> uh, it's great to see you. Welcome uh, to all of you. If you are watching online, really, really glad that you're uh, part of our service here today uh, too. Uh, we are this, uh, this theme, Hey Siri. Siri is this brilliant... Um, uh, innovation where we can speak into our phones and uh, we can ask a question and it comes back with answers. Sometimes it's verbal answers, sometimes it's websites that uh, will help you to find the answer. Uh, but there are a whole load of things that uh, if you go to Siri, Siri hasn't got a clue about because Siri can give information but Siri can't give wisdom. And so what we're doing over this series is where do we go to? Who's the Hey Siri for wisdom? And so we're exploring that. So last week we looked at, um, Johnny was here speaking brilliantly uh, about um, uh, why does life suck sometimes? Why is life really hard, really difficult? Today we're looking at why have I got two ears but only one mouth? I add one other question to that. Why are my ears bigger than everyone else? I just, it's just one of those really annoying things. But, uh, so that's what we're going to be thinking and there is a very clear answer to that question. Um, the beginning, or the beginning of the summer holidays, uh, back in July, uh, Sarah and I had a two-week holiday in Scotland, and uh, we were staying just outside of Perth um, at uh, my in-laws' um, house in a place uh, very close to Dunkeld. It's a beautiful, beautiful area. And so, for week one, uh, Malcolm and Hazel, my mum and dad-in-law, um, uh, were with Sarah and I, and uh, we went out and visited various places. Had a really nice time. The latter part of that first week, Sarah and I visited my sister in Scotland and kind of caught up with her. And when we came back again for the second week, Alice, my daughter, and her husband, Sam, joined us for the second week. And I was really excited and looking forward to that because I could spend time with my daughter. And uh, my son-in-law likes two things in life, whiskey and golf. So I, he is my favourite person in life, I tell you, those two things, whiskey and golf. And so on the first day, or just after the first day of when they arrived, uh, Sam and I went off to the Dunkeld and Burnham uh, golf course. And it is beautiful, it is stunning, it's really hilly, it overlooks a massive lock where there are ospreys. Uh, as you go into the back nine, there are deer that run across, oh, I tell you, it is so, so beautiful. And we had our first round and we both played quite well. Uh, and so we were quite excited by that. And so we spoke to the golf club and said, look, we're only here for a week. Would you do us a deal? Uh, and so they did us a fairly good deal. But the only way that it would work out as a good deal is if we played most days. So um, uh, the next day... <laughs> what? <laughs> what? There we go. See, look, that is stunning, isn't it? That not that stunning? You see, wouldn't you want to be out in God's creation like that every day? And, and so the next day we didn't play, but the following day um, we went just and played nine holes and that was really, really good. And so we decided that to get our money's worth, we were going to do it every day. So the next day, uh, Sam and I played and we hit the best scores that we had done on that golf course. So the next day that we went back, honestly, it just got better and better. Our golf improved so much. Uh, and what was really interesting, as we were going through that holiday, Sarah and I were incredibly close week one. Uh, and then what kind of happened? <laughs> yeah, any hopes of a great second week slowly kind of drifted, really. And there was one point in the holiday where Sarah just said to me, did you say that you were going to be playing golf each day? And I say, didn't I, darling? <laughs> and it didn't make any difference. So when we were travelling home, it was quiet in the car. Uh, in fact, in fact... What made it better, kind of, for me, is that the first Ashes test match had started. So, by the time we got back from golf, it was our evening meal, and then we could watch the Tour de France highlights, seven till eight, and then we could watch the cricket highlights from eight till nine. Personally, I don't see what the issue was, <laughs> but there was one. <laughs> there was one. And do you know what? In my head, this just gives you a little insight. In my head, I could argue why that was fine. 
Because I was spending time with my son-in-law, and I haven't seen much of my son-in-law over the last little while. I, I, I work, so I'm part of Crettingham Golf Club um, uh, on a country membership, but I, honestly, I don't get my value because I don't get to play um, uh, often enough to make it really uh, worthwhile. Um, it's the first kind of long holiday that we'd had this year. So it got to July, so I was tired, and it was just that kind of, I want to switch off, I want to switch off. And do you know what? I was right. I was right. And there is my wife doing the silent bit on me. Some of you blokes fully understand how I feel. All of you ladies fully understand how Sarah feels uh, at this point. And as I was trying to work it out in my head, do you know what? I, I learned a brilliant, brilliant lesson. I listened to a talk by a man called Andy Stanley that this talk is based on. And, uh, and he taught me something which I want you to get. And I want you to understand because it will be the making of your marriage. It will be the making of your friendships. It will be the making of your family life. And it's this. Being right doesn't make things right. <laughs> That's what I found out. Being right doesn't make things right. Honestly, in my head, I was right. I was, I was right. The next part is making things right makes things right. So I say again, being right doesn't make things right. Making things right makes things right. How do we do that? And this is where the question of why have we got two ears and one mouth, this is where this comes in so important in helping to answer the question. Because this little statement that I want to mention, honestly, every marriage, every family, every friendship should adopt this statement. So are you ready? This is it. Be quick to listen, slow to speak. Be quick to listen and slow to speak. Go on, say it with me. Be quick to listen, slow to speak. You liked the second part there, didn't you? Slow, yes. Be quick to listen and slow to speak. Why? I'll tell you why. It's because whenever conflict occurs between two people, whether it's husband and wife, whether it's friends, whether it's family, parent, children, whatever, whenever there is conflict, the one thing which we all desperately want is to be heard. We def desperately want, not just to be heard, but we want to be understood. And so when arguments take place, nearly always we are right, and we take the position that you've got to hear what I'm saying and what I'm feeling and what I'm thinking. And arguments flare up and shouting can start. Why? Because we don't feel heard and we don't feel understood. And so emotions take over uh, and then the big rows take place. And what often we think is, in order to be heard, we've just got to shout louder. It's a little bit like my dad. My dad's just sitting over there. When my dad meets a person uh, from a foreign uh, country and they don't speak very good English, my dad just speaks a little bit slower and louder. And in fact, he speaks Pigeon England. Do you know where blues are? And then he'll just keep going over it because they don't understand because they, they can't get it. And so just shouting louder actually doesn't make any difference. Be quick to listen and slow to speak. Do you know what? This can be a game changer for every relationship that you are part of. You see, what can you not accomplish if you're quick to listen, quick to understand the other person's point of view, and when you are slow to speak? Imagine feeling really understood by your spouse, or your friend, or your boss. Imagine you listening and really trying to work out, what are they thinking? Why are they saying those things? How can I understand where they are coming from? Now, that little phrase there, if you've been part of church for um, uh, a while, or if you've read your Bible um, uh, over the years, you will know that I have just pinched that phrase. And I've pinched that phrase from a letter that has once been written, which is incorporated within the New Testament. It, that, in fact, that phrase is 2,000 years old. It was written by a wise man, and his name was James. And that's the book, the letter, that we are looking at over this series of Hey Siri. 
And James had a very famous brother, and his brother was... Jesus, absolutely. Yep, that's right. So after the death and the resurrection of Jesus, the church established in um, Jerusalem. Uh, And the leader of the church of Jerusalem was James. Now, so basically, if you were to visit the church there in Jerusalem, he would either be leading the worship like Ben was or would be speaking like I am. He was the leader of the church. And James, uh, James's life came to an abrupt end in AD 62. There was a, a high priest who was incredibly jealous of James. He didn't like James because James believed in the resurrection. James preached the resurrection. It's why James was a follower of Jesus, because he'd seen his brother come back to life. That's why he believed. And so everything was centered around Jesus' death and his resurrection. And the high priest of the time in Jerusalem, a man called Ananias, he was what's known as a Sadducee. And a Sadducee didn't believe in life after death. They believed that when you're dead, you're dead, that's it. And there was James preaching a different message. And so So he got the opportunity to be able to get James killed. And James was stoned to death in AD 62. But before he died, he wrote a letter. And the letter went out to a group of Christians who were struggling under the persecution of that time. And as part of that letter, James writes these words. This is what he says. Understand this. My dear brothers and sisters. So this is not just his immediate family. He's he's writing to a church. And as part of the church, part of God's family, he terms them as brothers and sisters. Here we go. You must be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to get angry. Now, some of you will be really used to this word, these words here. You must be quick to listen. How can you be quick to listen? How do you do that? How can you speed up listening? Because that's what he seems to be saying here. And basically what he's doing, he's making a point and he's emphasising the importance of when it comes to relationships, if we want relationships to work really well, our priority first of all, because God has given us two ears and only one mouth, we are to be quick to listen. That should be our number one priority in our relationships. Quick to listen before anything else. Which, let's be honest, that is exactly what we want from other people, isn't it? That we want other people to listen to us. And so when we start to have a disagreement, what we long for people to say is, will you explain that situation? I'm not quite getting it. Just to give you the chance so that you can be understood. And sometimes if we feel that we've been understood and listened to, we don't mind if the answer is different. (laughs) We don't mind if the other person... Because we've been heard... Because all of us desperately, desperately, desperately want to be heard and we want want to be understood. So James says, my dear brothers and sisters, you must be quick to listen. And then he goes on to that other statement, which is we need to be quick to listen, but we need to be slow to speak. The idea of being slow to speak is the idea of being late. In other words, so, so... Don't jump in too quickly. What I find really interesting, when it comes to group situations and stories, you know when funny stories start to be told and and one person tells a story and that sparks someone else, uh, basically people are really, really thinking of what's my story that I can tell? And so they stop listening to the person who's telling because my story's funnier. And so then we try to get in so that we can then be the centre of attention. Some of you are looking vague. That is just me, isn't it? Oh, no. (laughs) But often we are really keen to get our voice heard. And so we like to jump into, we like to um, uh, either correct people or, or we like to interrupt in some way because what we have to say becomes very, very important. In fact, I don't think it should just be we should be slow to speak. I think we should be this. I think we should be curious. I think that we should be not only quick to listen, but when we do speak, Why don't we ask more questions? Why don't we find out at a deeper level, what is it that they're saying? Why is it that they're saying it that way? What's shaped their thinking on that? Start to become curious so that you can understand where the other person uh, is coming from. We need to be quick to listen and slow to speak. Now, if you do that, if you do those two ideas in any relationship, 
So just think of the last person you had a row with or a falling out with. Okay, so that might have been just a few minutes ago in the car coming here, okay, right? Just, just have a think. Were you quick to listen? Did you try to understand their point of view? Or were you pretty quick in trying to get in there to make your point of view known? You know what? When we are not heard, something else happens. We become angry. This is what he says. You must be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. Being angry is both the result of something, but it's also a decision that we can make as well. And do you know what? If you are quick to listen and slow to speak, you are less likely to be angry. It's easier to guard against anger when you're understanding the other person's point of view. When we stop and say, I'm going to be curious here. I'm going to ask some questions. I want to really hear what it is that they're saying. And all of us will express anger in different ways. Some of us will blow up uh, and we will shout and, and we will make our displeasure known, our frustration known. Uh, and so often that's where voices get raised. Others, p- other people going to go inward uh, and, and they stop talking. Do you know what? I don't ever think that Sarah and I have ever had a row. Honestly, we haven't. We have never raised our voices and had a real slanging match at each other. We have had days of not speaking. <laughs> but, um, well, we can be polite, do you know what I mean? But um, uh, when suddenly we've just closed off from the other person. And so there will be times where, when Sarah says, are you all right? And I go, yes. And, and she knows that I'm not, and I know that I'm not, but I'm not prepared to say because I'm not going to say anything. Because that's my way of trying to control the issue, to say that actually I am really angry, I'm just not going to tell you at the moment. The point is, is this, what James is saying, this is, this is brilliant for relationships and going the other way, it is so bad for relationships. And one of the ways to bypass this um, passive aggressiveness or, or these rows, one of the ways is to understand where the other person is coming from, be quick to listen and slow to speak. Anger in the context of what he's talking about here is this frustration, this frustration that I'm right and you're not getting it. I'm right and you're not getting it. So, so going back to my golfing holiday, you know, uh, I, I knew why, she, why Sarah was cross. Of course I did afterwards. Um, uh, 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 but, it, but there was a frustration inside of me that says, but it's not fair. I, I, of course I should have been allowed to do that. And so it's the, that's what he's talking about here when it says slow to get angry. It's out of that frustration. And do you know what? There is a formula to overcome that. And the formula is this. If you're happy just to bring it up. The longer you listen, the more you learn, the less angry you become. The longer you listen, the more you learn, the less angry you become. For Sarah and I, I have been married 16 and a half years now, and uh, the first seven years were pretty difficult for us. Um, uh, with Sarah, one, marrying me, that's hard enough, but having three children and marrying the church leader and, and all of those things, uh, it, it was really hard. And the one thing which Sarah really, really struggled with was me not understanding how she felt of how hard that was for her. Because I loved my kids. My my kids, they're they're mine, so of course. So why can't Sarah just love them like like I do? But they weren't her kids. Uh, And within those first few years, it was really, I just didn't understand her. And for her, that caused such heartache uh, and at times such frustration. Until we were able to go and see someone who could help uh, to talk that through so that I could start to get a glimpse of how hard that had been uh, for Sarah. So we're doing strong now. We're doing much better. Why? Because um, I've, I've been able to understand better her point of view and of where, she, where she's come from. And when she feels understood, life seems so much better that way too. And that's because... Of, of this very simple fact. The simple fact is this, that everything everyone does makes sense to them. It does. And everything everyone says makes sense to them, and everything everyone believes makes sense to them. It does. So me and my golf, that made perfect sense to me, 
Sarah, feeling aggrieved about losing me for the second week of the holiday, made total sense to her. Of course it does, because how we view things will make sense to us. And whenever we catch ourselves about other people uh, asking those questions, you know, why do they just keep jumping into relationships? Why why did they say that? Why don't they just stop doing that? When we start asking those questions, it's because for the other people, it makes perfect sense to them as to why they're acting, believing, uh, and saying what they do. And whenever we ask the question, I don't understand, it gives you a clue that it gives us a clue that we are then, by asking questions, by being quick to listen, we can come to understand from their point of view, if we are curious. I don't know whether any of you have ever sat down with a homeless person. But if you go into Ipswich or Bury, uh, and you were to see someone there, uh, and someone who's been sleeping rough, and you were to sit next to them, before you sit next to them, It's really easy to think, well, they just need to find a home. They just need to sort out a relationship. They uh, they, they should go and um, uh, find a hostel somewhere. And it's really easy to explain what they should be doing. And when you sit down with them and you start to hear their story and you start to hear the brokenness of how they've got to this point, I promise you, you will change your opinion of them and of their situation. That's what going to Denver, our Denver partnership, did for me the very first time. Going out onto the streets. Up until that point, I never looked at homeless people. I just didn't. It was too embarrassing. And I thought they were always after money. So, uh, and and they were, I was only going to uh, fuel their addictions. So what's the point of giving them any money? And then suddenly I was sitting down alongside Bex Drake and I was sitting down alongside Dan... Um, Dan Wasp, who was with me. And we would sit and, and we would talk with people. And all of a sudden, my understanding changed. It just did. Why? Because I wasn't so quick to speak. I was much quicker to listen, to understand, to be curious. And then all of a sudden, the situation changed for me. Are you critical of a friend because they've said something to you that hurt you? Are you critical of a spouse or of a parent or of a child because of how they responded to you? Well, probably from their frame of reference, what they said or what they did made sense to them. It did. That's why they reacted as they did. It is our job not just to be critical, but it's our job to be quick to listen, to understand, to learn, to see it from their point of view. James, when he writes this letter, it's not just about relationship. He's got more to say. He says, this is more than just getting on well with each other, good though that is. Do you know what? There is a divine agenda involved in all of this. And so suddenly he widens this out and he goes on to say this. You must be quick to listen, slow to speak and slow to get angry. Human anger does not produce the righteousness that God requires. Human anger when we don't get our own way, when we get frustrated, when we blow up, when we sulk. James says that kind of anger doesn't produce the rightness, the right way of living that God wants for every one of you. See, whenever we get into an argument, we, want, we know our way is right. Of course we do. That's why we argue. So we, and we're trying to get our point of view across to the other person. Uh, and so we'll raise our voice or we'll go silent, whatever, so that we can be understood and so that we can get our view across. And the problem is with that is that we think that we're right. Every time we think that we're right. And therefore, God must be on our side because God's on the side of right. And what James is saying here is that God is not on your side and he's not on the other person's side. In fact, God is not on any side when it comes to our arguments. What James is saying is that God wants for us a different kind of rightness. And that rightness is this, that you want to be right at each other, he says. But I want you to be right with each other. That's why Jesus, when when he taught, there's so much that he taught about how we can live. But ultimately it was summed up in one command that Jesus said. 
And his command was this, is that we were to love one another. Just as I have loved you, Jesus says, just as I haven't come to be right, in fact, I've come to reconcile people to God and to each other. Just as I have loved you, you should love one another. In other words, you should put other people before yourself. So he says to you and to me, quit being right at each other, quit trying to win the argument and figure out who's right. Approach it differently. And we say, how do we do that? And he says, but I've already told you, you've got to be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. Then he goes on after this, James, um, and he finishes off by say, this little section uh, by saying this. So get rid of all the moral filth and evil in your lives. It's like, wow. Do you know what I mean? He's now throwing a whole load of stuff on us at this point. And when he says get rid of it, basically means take off. It's like if you've got a coat with an I'm right on the back. <laughs> I'm right. Yes, yeah, so we put that coat on because that's what we want to do whenever we have an argument. I'm right. And he's saying take that coat off. Get rid of that. And when he talks about the moral filth and evil, uh, what he's saying is this. You know what self-righteousness looks like. It's horrible. When you meet someone and they're always right and they have to be right and they force their opinion on other people, we hate that, don't we? And actually what that does is that it leads to all kinds of horrible things happening in our society. Domestic violence doesn't start with domestic violence. It starts with one person wanting to be right and being in control. Violence doesn't normally start with a punch. It normally starts with verbal words. Do you see how this starts, the anger starts to spread out? That's why he says you've got to get rid of the moral filth and the evil in your lives. Then he goes on to say this. When we've done that, when we get rid of the moral uh, filth and evil in your lives, he says, and humbly accept the word of God planted in your hearts, for it has the power to save your souls. So what James is saying is this, I want you to take off the I'm right coat and I want you to put on the humility jacket. I want you to be humble. And what does being humble mean? Being humble means that we is better than me. That you come before me. That's what being humble is all about. And he says, I want you to accept the word God has planted in your hearts. What James is doing is James is writing to Christians He's writing to his brothers and sisters, as he calls them, as part of the family of God. And so he's writing to them and to say, look, guys, you know the big picture. You know that Jesus didn't come to earth to be right. He came to earth to reconcile people to God and people to each other. And how did he do that? Well, he put you and me before himself. And why do we follow Jesus? It's because his love, the overwhelming love of God, we've sung about it, that Jesus chose to put you and me before himself, which is why he died on the cross, which meant that we could be right with our heavenly father through having our failure and our sin forgiven. And he says, you know the big picture. You know that's what God's done for you. Now you need to start putting that into practice in your relationship. In your marriage, put your spouse before yourself. In your friendships, put your uh, friendship before yourself. When it comes to your kids or your parents, put your parents or your kids before yourself. How do we do that? James says it's simple. Be quick to listen and slow to speak and slow to become angry. Let me read through these verses as I finish. Just to remind us, because I've kind of broken up into little bits, so let's, let's pull it all back together again. This is what will revolutionise our relationships with each other, and actually it models the relationship that God has demonstrated to you and me as well. And if you're not a believer as yet, you don't have to do this, but you will be foolish not to do this. Because it's the way to make relationships work when we put one another before ourselves. So this is what James said. Understand this, my brothers and sisters. You must all 
That's not just your husband and wife, unfortunately, or not just your parent or just your child. This is all of us. You must all be quick to listen, slow to speak, don't jump in, don't correct, ask questions, be curious, and slow to get angry. Because when you understand the other person's point of view, you won't feel as frustrated and angry anymore. Human anger doesn't produce the righteousness God desires. Self-rightness is horrible. God says, get rid of that. Get rid of all of the filth and the evil in your eyes and humbly accept the Word God has planted in your hearts. What is the Word? That Christ came not to be right, but Christ came to reconcile you and me to God. He put us first. For it has the power to save your souls. So learn the lesson of a golfing holiday that shouldn't have been a golfing holiday. Being right doesn't make things right. Making things right makes things right. So what do we do with that? What do we do with it? Do we go, interesting talk, or I dropped off halfway through that? Or do we take seriously what James is saying? To model our life on his older brother, Jesus, who put you and me before himself. And he says, now go do likewise. Let me pray for us. In fact, can we stand together? Father, I thank you that your truth and your word is just so practical for us. That Lord, when we take it on board, when we apply it, it changes things so much. Lord, forgive us for those times when we argue the I'm right and use the I'm right card. Forgive us when we try to include you on our side to try and add a bit more weight to what we think. And Father, I pray that you would help every one of us, whether we are followers of Jesus or not, to help us to learn this principle of being quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to become angry. In fact, God, would you perform a miracle in the Brexit talks? (laughs) And would you help some of those politicians to start being quick to listen and slow to speak and certainly slow to become angry? But God, work that out in our family life, in our friendships, in our work. And help us to model what you showed to us, how you put us first. Help us to take an action, Lord, to start listening more, to ask those questions, to understand. I pray this, Lord, for your glory, because we want to reflect who you are as followers of you. In Jesus' name, amen.